Before we get started, I wanted to pray. Uh, thank you if you are here for our mini series. We don't have any announcements. Today is our first lesson in our mini series, uh, lesson four, five, and six about encountering Jesus. And so uh, before we get started in our lecture, again, I just wanted to say I'm Angie Aravilla. I'm the substitute teaching leader for our Women's Day class. And um, I will go ahead and pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, you are amazing, and amazing is your grace. Thank you for the, grief, the free gift of salvation that you give us through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that as we get into the lecture, that I am minimized and you are maximized, that I may decrease so you may be increased, Lord. And I thank you for this lesson and reminder that John the Baptist gives us. Thank you for the wonderful example that we have in Jesus Christ, the perfect son. We love you and we praise you, and it's in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, I go by Angie, but my actual given name is Angelica Arvilla. I have the honor of serving VSF as your substitute teaching leader, like I said. I am a wife, I am a mother to three children, I am a sister to three siblings, I am an aunt to three nieces and nephews, I homeschool my kids, and I volunteer on the school's board but most importantly, I am a daughter of a king. None of my titles, roles, or responsibilities are, any, are of any worth if I am not defined as being a woman of God. I love Jesus and believe him to be the Son of God and Lord and Savior of my life. What is the most important name you have? Who is it that you would say you are? What would be some of the honorable titles you were called? Wife, mother, sister, grandmother, aunt, director, teacher. More importantly, do those around you know you are a Christian? A famous song sings, they will know we are Christian by our love. Is that a mark of how people identify you, love? In this week's passage in John 3, we look at Jesus as the light of the world who gives new life for all who believe. John is building on the plan and purpose of Jesus Christ. As we see his first of many encounters, we learn who we are individually and collectively in humanity as he deals with matters of the heart. We have three sections. We see how Jesus encounters Nicodemus in our first section, in our first division. Jesus exposes sin and our need for salvation in our second and how John the Baptist exalts Jesus again in our third. So as we dig into our first section, I hope we see that Jesus invites all to believe in him and receive eternal life. So who is Nicodemus? Jesus teaches a teacher, but he wasn't just any teacher. He was the teacher, a Pharisee, the only one of mention in scripture. He was a scholar. He was an elevated member of the Sanhedrin, he knew and followed the law to the letter. Even if we have achieved, we have achieved the highest level of education or are an expert in our field, we all have room to learn. Jesus, being omniscient, all-knowing, encounters Nicodemus' heart. Nicodemus knew of Jesus, saw the signs, and knew it can only be from God. He is the teacher, after all, of Israel. He is a very important religious leader but he's defined by being fearful, doubtful, and unsure. He goes to Jesus under the cover of night. I love how the notes point out he goes to the light in the, car, in the cover of darkness. He goes to the light in the cover of darkness. Jesus is always talking in parables, so it is, significant, is it significant that Jesus comes at night? Maybe. Is it indicative of the darkness in him? Maybe. What we do know from scripture is that he did not come during the day. I do think it is interesting, though, whether it was fear of being persecuted or shame of being compromised, he does two things. He comes, and he acknowledges Jesus as rabbi and says, we know that you are a teacher from God. He is not alone in his thinking. So why this statement, not a question or a request, this study's word is truth, John, the truth. 
And that is what Jesus gives him. He gives him a double dose of truth, saying in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus knew Nicodemus was spiritually blind. And as one of, le- as one of the leaders mentioned yesterday, Jesus was looking for transformation, not information. Thank you, Norma, for that. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God, uh, John is highlighting Jesus' deity and references his truly, truly's 25 times in his gospel account. So what does it mean to be born again? Although confusing to Nicodemus, it is a perfect illustration of the new life we have in Christ. We have no control of our physical or spiritual birth. There is nothing we contribute to our physical birth, so why would we have anything to contribute to our spiritual birth? Being born again is not of blood. It isn't something you inherit, nor is it the will of the flesh, like if you want it really bad. It is not a will of man, like a human religious process, but spiritual birth comes from above. Jesus was the author of the law. He came to fulfill the law, And he knew the law could not save. Man has one greatest need, to be saved from sin. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Romans 10, 10, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Salvation is a sinner's worry, the Savior's way, and the Spirit's work in us. This gives us our first principle. Jesus invites all to believe in him and receive eternal life. Jesus invites all to believe in him and receive eternal life. Salvation is a free gift from God and can be defined as being delivered by grace from the eternal punishment of sin that is granted to those who accept by faith God's conditions of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like any party invitation, not all who are invited come. Faith is believing in the promises of God. It says the crowd, they believed. They believed in Jesus' name that he was a teacher from God, but that wasn't enough to save. So what's the difference? What is saving faith? Saving faith is is a divine calling. Sorry, Nicodemus, this isn't something you can do yourself. So do we look at things from a heavenly perspective or do we look at things with our earthly eyes like Nicodemus? Whoever believes by faith alone, in Latin, sola fide, faith comes from hearing the gospel, knowing, believing in its truth, trusting, and taking up our cross in obedience, committing. Jesus makes the greatest commitment of faith obedient to the Father by laying down his own life for all. In verse 15, it says that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Whoever wasn't just the chosen Jew. It was Jew and Gentile. He goes even further to speak on one of the most famous verses behind his motivation of love. Verse 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The audience was a divided people with hatred for one another, much like our world today. But nonetheless, Jesus says, the world. His perfect love is for all humanity. God sends his only begotten, beloved son, Jesus. Jesus is the only one, and God's love extends to us because he gives us the one he truly loved. The free offer of the gospel is broad enough to extend to the worst sinner who believes, but is narrow enough to exclude the most moral, religious unbeliever. By faith alone, you shall not perish, but have eternal life. Looking at this text, I don't want to be condemned. Darkness is scary. Hell seems like a nightmare. I can't imagine anyone choosing that over the blessings we see in these passages. But the contrast is a warning. It warns us the difference between saving faith and fear-based faith. I think 
I think this is where we see head knowledge, the understanding, but not the heart knowledge, the believing. God sends Jesus to save the world, not to scare the world. In love, he sent his beloved son because he loved humanity, his creation, that much. This gives us our second principle. Jesus intercedes for all sinners, securing eternal salvation. Jesus intercedes for all sinners, securing eternal salvation. Do you believe that you're loved that much? That God in his infinite power and infinite mercy gave himself up for you, for me, for us all? He did. Christ is the savior of the world. Verse 18 says, already. We also need to understand our disbelief doesn't condemn us. The divine judge has already delivered his verdict before we were born. Final judgment was passed long ago at the fall. Every sinner is already condemned. And that's why the only way is belief in the Son of God. Jesus Christ, who came in the world to save us, we are all lawbreakers. No one is perfect, not one. So why doesn't everyone believe? We can believe in Jesus' name like the crowd who saw his miracles, but they loved their sin and darkness more than Jesus, the light. Do we see Jesus as just a a, a get-out-of-jail-free card? Do we think that believing in Jesus will make our life easier, make us richer, make us a better person? This is the reason Jesus did not give himself over to the crowd, because he knew what was in them and his time had not yet come. Truth seekers practice shining light. Are you like the roaches in an infested apartment that scatter when the light is turned on? Or are you like the light that causes the darkness to scatter? If you are a Christian, you are called to be the light. The great commission is to go forth and make disciples, clothing ourselves in humility like John the Baptist. John the Baptist, John baptizes Jesus, he gets in prison in Matthew's account, but in verse 24, he had not been imprisoned yet, and he clarifies the timeline of their overlapping ministry again to point to the purpose and plan of Jesus. This particular exchange is important to John in his gospel account because he again warns us to see how easily Envy can creep into the most honorable of ministries. John the Baptist could have felt privileged from getting, to be, from getting to baptize Jesus, the chosen one. He could have been discouraged by the declining numbers, yet he was filled with joy and exalts Jesus at every encounter. All who are faithfully called experience moments when they have to choose to minimize themselves to magnify Jesus. Did you know that in BSF, our vision is to magnify God and mature his people? We learned our focus earlier this year was to make Jesus known. This world has so many voices and so many competing truths. So Christian, you must speak. Speak up in your groups, speak up in your churches, speak up in whatever circles God has placed you. What better way to make Jesus known than to let the Holy Spirit in us shine through us in our humble service. Our light, no matter how bright, pales in comparison to the glory and brilliance as the Son of God. The sun in our sky is so bright. We, in our vulnerable state, would go blind if we looked into the brightness too long. How much greater is the glory of God? The stars at night, they diminish in the background, unseen in the presence of the sun. The sun brings warmth, growth, and makes things visible. Everything in creation points to the creator. And it is no wonder Jesus is called the light of the world. John was also a great, he was a great preacher, he was a great servant, a great prophet, a great messenger, pointing to the Messiah always. Did he dress well? No, he wore camel hair and a belt. Did he feast? No, he ate locusts and honey. His great lesson to us is how important it is that we fade away so we can make Jesus known. He lovingly replies to his disciples in verse 27 
A person cannot receive one, even one thing, unless it is given from heaven. This example of humility is magnificent as he exalts the Messiah. As a mom, I would tell my toddlers, no hitting, no biting, no spitting. It was a strange rhyme, but it was necessary at the time. As they got older, it became no complaining, no comparing, no competing. No comparing, no complaining, no competing. I felt like I should have been talking to John the Baptist's disciples. His disciples had the best of intentions to honor their master. They were zealous and jealous for him and would find ways to, find, to fade for Jesus' fame out of obedience for their friend. Do we sometimes do that too? We do the wrong thing out of the best intentions? Again, John points to things above. Last week, we saw the importance and illustration of Jesus' miracles at the wedding feast in Cana. Marriage, like the example of Christ in the church, helps us to see the intimate relationship of this God-honoring covenant. And it is the best illustration to see John the Baptist as the best man. Traditionally, back then, in a wedding party, the best man would walk ahead, making the way for the groom. The best man would prepare the bridegroom's house for all the family and friends. He would present the bride to the bridegroom. John the Baptist made the way for the Messiah. He made the way for Jesus by baptizing in his name. He prepared the house by preparing the hearts of his people. He presents the bride, believers, the universal church, to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. John the Baptist's life did not have a happy ending according to worldly standards. He was imprisoned and he was beheaded. Yet, he is called friend of Jesus, and his life was marked by peace and joy. Jesus' way is better than our way if we have a humble heart and submit to the service he's called us to. Ministry is a mercy that flows to an unworthy Christian by God's sovereign grace. Like salvation, we can't earn it, we can't gain it, we can't achieve it. In Jesus' strength, we can accomplish what only he's called us to. We see through John the Baptist's beautiful service, Jesus inspires obedience and imparts great joy for those who are born again. This gives us our third and final principle. Jesus inspires obedience and imparts great joy. Have you had the privilege of sharing the gospel with a friend or family member and have gotten to see the fruit from their life in Christ? If you have, then you know the supernatural joy that John the Baptist got to experience. We sometimes seek the experience without the divine encounter. Our ministries, our mini series is called Encounters with Jesus because that is the only way to experience his miraculous power. What's stopping you today? Invite a friend to encounter Jesus through this study. Today is the day. In verse 28, it says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear, hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. There is unbelievable supernatural joy that comes from witnessing the work of the Holy Spirit. And John the Baptist got to see it daily. Though his numbers decreased, he rejoiced because it was complete. The long-awaited Messiah was here. If you have not put your trust and hope in Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. He, like the bridegroom, wants not only a relationship, but a lifelong commitment. He wants us to come willingly and with an open heart. His love is everlasting, and the life he offers is eternal. It is truly the greatest love story. If you are at the end of yourself, that is okay, because that is where Jesus encounters us in his love. John the Baptist exalts Jesus because he knows Jesus is the only light that gives new life for all who believe. Thank you, Jesus, for your irresistible grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your words. I thank you for your holy word, and I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. 
I pray that your Holy Spirit be in us, with us, through us, um, today, tomorrow, always. I pray that anyone who does not know you, that today is the day that they put their faith and hope and trust in you, Lord. This lesson was a great reminder that we are here because of you. We are nothing without you. And the presence of sin separates us, but no longer because you have given us the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain for our sins. And so, Lord, I thank you that we can call on you, that we can come to you with anything, the smallest thing. I thank you, Lord, for being always accessible and always ever hearing and ever patient and ever loving. Lord, we love you, but we love you because you first loved us. So thank you, God. We lift all our prayers and our concerns and our heart up to you, Lord. Bless this space, bless this place, and bless these ladies here. We love you and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies, and I hope to see you guys next week. Have a great fall break.